Good morning, everyone. It is indeed a beautiful day here in New York. As we see the storm clouds are parting, as are the COVID clouds parting. And this is a very good day for us to have a conversation as we've been doing for many, many months here. Uh, as always, I'm joined by an extraordinary team of professionals. Catherine Garcia, the head of state operations, who uh, is incredible in terms of dealing with everything from every storm that comes our way, a COVID storm or a storm in Ulster. Same to be said with uh, Jackie Bray, our commissioner of Homeland Security and Emergency Service. We, we spent a lot of time in some icy places this past week, but uh, I was very proud of every, every effort undertaken by the members of our team to help get people their power and restore their lives uh, in Ulster County, which was hard hit. Also, Dr. Bassett, who has been doing an amazing job as our Commissioner of Health uh, going before the legislature. Congratulations on getting through that milestone. It shows you've been tested. Uh, and also, I think they all recognize this is heralding in a new era of collabor collaboration and cooperation, and I'm, I'm proud of the efforts you're taking. So we've been talking about our COVID numbers. They are declining on many fronts. And what I'd like to do is start talking about the next phase. And let's just take a look back at where we've come over the last you know, few months, few weeks, and in the scheme of things, it really has been a fairly short time. Uh, we talked about our anticipation of a very serious winter surge, even back in September. I, mean, I had been on the job just a month, and I wanted to make sure that we knew that our healthcare workers were vaccinated. Uh, viewed as controversial at the time, but we stood firm and said that anyone who enters a hospital or a nursing facility or any medical center should have the knowledge that they will not contract COVID from the person charged with their health. So we stood by that mandate and you know, heard a lot about it, but we stood with it. And I'm proud that that was part of our efforts to fight what was the impending winter surge. We started talking in October about the vulnerabilities of the gathering times, whether it's Halloween, Thanksgiving, uh, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Christmas, New Year's. Martin Luther King weekend, people travel. Uh, then a Super Bowl, which we'll get to some other day, another year, I guess. Um, and also Valentine's Day is coming up. So we saw vulnerabilities because we had the pattern from the year before. That's what we've been relying on, is looking at the data and the trends from the previous year. So we talked about making preparations literally right around Thanksgiving. And we talked about uh, making sure that we had capacity in our hospitals. That included me signing an executive order that allowed hospitals and any case where a capacity has gone below 10 percent that they have surge and flex capacity and suspend their elective surgeries that again created more capacity in hospitals which in retrospect was a critical point and a critical step we took to make sure that we could handle what was coming our way literally within the next couple weeks by december 1st again our first case of omicron had just hit there we were already deploying the National Guard to help our nursing homes and to talk about you know, how we can protect society's most vulnerable as we had seen them uh, so devastated during the first couple of uh, variants from COVID. So we always think about them and how we can protect them the most. And so December 10th came around. We were watching what was happening around the world. We saw what had happened in South Africa. We saw how quickly Omicron spread we saw what was happening in England, the UK. We are studying what was happening around the globe and saying, this is coming our way. We know this is coming to New York and we need to be prepared for that. So literally on December 10th, in anticipation that we're heading into the busy holiday season, lots of family gatherings, lots of people going in and out of stores for their holiday purchases, people going to be gathering in restaurants. We said, we do not want to shut down our economy. Because I've said from the beginning, we're keeping New York open. But how can we protect people knowing what is coming across the horizon? We saw it coming. So what we did on December 10th, literally two months ago, was initiate, and I don't think any other states followed suit with this, a plan to say that across the state, any business would have the option, either require people to be vaccinated or let them choose if they wanted to just enforce having people wear masks. Um, it was a strong action to take at the time. We heard a lot about it, but I again stand behind that as our effort to not have to resort to shutting down businesses when this variant ended up spreading like wildfire. So we're proud of that accomplishment 
And by December 31st, those of you who gathered with me on New Year's Eve, most of you did not, uh, we were up in Albany talking about our winter surge plan 2.0 and how we can do even more to make vaccines and boosters and text kits more widely available. And then we, we got hit hard. Uh, right in anticipation of this surge, we were ready. We had test kits, we had vaccination sites. And you think about where we were, look at that number. 90,000 people, 90,000 New Yorkers tested positive one month ago. Look how quickly that went up from December 10th when we put our business mask or vax requirement in place. Look at that trajectory. We saw it coming, it happened. We hit our peak on January 7th, but now we've witnessed a 93% drop in cases. We are now below February 8th with 6,000 cases, below where we were on December 10th where we had 11,000 cases and cases were just starting to spike up. So that is what we've been watching for. That is exactly what we've been waiting for. That's what we've been talking about, and it is finally happening. Let's also talk about other metrics. Our statewide seven-day average positivity. December 10th, 4.2%. Our One of our worst days, January 2nd, 23% of people tested. And we had 400,000 people being tested. We were testing everybody. I was out at testing sites from every corner of the state, and people did an extraordinary job to make the tests available so people could know whether or not they should stay home or they could carry on with their lives. So that was really important. So enormous number of tests being done, higher than any state in the nation, and we are showing a 23% infection rate, those who are being tested, testing positive. So look at that drop, another drop in actual numbers from 23% to February 8th, 3.67%, and the numbers continue to decline. That's an optimistic sign as well. That's what we've been waiting for. You've heard me talk about hospitalizations. My biggest nightmare was thinking that our hospitals could be so overrun with patients that we would not have the capacity to handle them. We are experiencing a serious shortage of healthcare workers. Many of them had been sick. We lost some, literally lost their lives when they ran into the, the burning building, so to speak, during the height of the pandemic when it hit New York City so hard two years ago. Many of them retired. Many of them are exhausted. And so we had a severe shortage of workers. What does that mean? That means you can have beds, but if they're not staff beds, you can't accept a patient to be taken care of. And there's certain ratios that have to be met to make sure they're getting quality care. So I've always been concerned about this number. We are seeing, as you saw that peak, of how many people are hospitalized. January 12th, we had 12,000 people in hospitals. We've now seen a 63% drop with 4,600 hospitalizations yesterday. That is still higher than we had been, but look at that trend. It's going down quickly. And we've been talking about our bed capacity. We had parts of our state where it dropped to zero. There's, those are the places where we had to suspend elective surgeries. We have sent National Guard into many hospitals to help them. They've been so grateful. I've gone in person and thanked them. So now we have seen our bed capacity go up to about 20%, and that's gonna to continue to rise. But again, that gives me the comfort to know if I need to deploy people from one healthcare system that's doing well to another one, we have that flexibility. So now our total hospital bed census is about the same, and the healthcare workers are getting healthier. Many of them were sick themselves uh, just one month ago, and uh, we're seeing some other metrics as well that are looking really good. Again, we look at the cases per 100,000. Look at the warning sign here. Uh, December 10th, we had 51 per 100,000. Still considered a high number at the time considering how low it had been just a couple months before. But at our peak, it was 381 per 100,000. That's incredible. That was one of the highest in the nation, um, second highest. Look where we are today. We are now the fourth lowest in the nation, fourth lowest with 32 per 100,000. Why is all this happening? Because New Yorkers and businesses stepped up and did the right thing. And I will always be grateful for them for being the reason these numbers have been declining. And again, we'll talk about our hospital admissions. We mentioned this a little while back. I started asking the questions. I made countless calls to hospital leaders in every corner of the state. I asked them, 
what are we seeing? Are these people really sick with COVID? Are, we call them a COVID patient. Are they diagnosed with COVID? Are they in a hospital sick because of COVID? And back in December, only 18% were in this category of incidental COVID. People that were tested because they entered a healthcare facility were in there for some other purpose. You know, it could have been a heart attack, could have been a car accident. Only 18% were these incidental. And that's when Delta was the primary variant. Look at the change. Look at the change when our hospital admissions went up to 1,900 a day. Daily new admissions was 1,900. We are now down to a much better number, down 53%. But also you'll see, or I'm sorry, you'll see that there's been a change in that trajectory. Now more than half of the people admitted for COVID, listed as COVID, are in for another reason. That also goes to the severity of what we're dealing with here. Yes, they're still taking a bed. Yes, there's still a healthcare worker who has to take care of them. Yes, they need medical attention. But when you're trying to analyze what we're going through right now, you can look at that number and look at in two months uh, what has changed. And so now the majority were asymptomatic for COVID, but were tested positive. Uh, so these are part of those individuals who don't even know they had COVID. So that's another comparison that we thought was important. And these numbers are down all across the state. I talked to Dr. Fauci the other day as I continue my daily calls with healthcare experts in the state, other states, and in Washington. And he said, are you also looking at the infection to hospital ratio, which was an interesting observation. We learned from these, this data that of the people that are contracting Delta, look at August, 2021, Delta, 62% uh, of people who are infected ended up in the hospital. With this Omicron variant, we see only 3.5% did. Now you can also factor into that that many more people are vaccinated. And we've been saying from the beginning, if you get vaccinated, if you get boosted, your chance of being seriously ill enough to go to a hospital is dramatically reduced. This is what this bears out as well. So uh, Delta was severe. Omicron is not considered as severe, but I will tell you there are still people lying in a hospital today because of Omicron. So it is something we still take very, very seriously, but that's a smaller ratio. And I mentioned vaccinations. Very proud that we are number one among the larger states for having people vaccinated. We've been aggressive about this. Pop-ups, masked sites, engaging uh, our, our partners in the private sector, clergy, everybody we could possibly think of has been involved in this process. So right now we have uh, about 70% of our teenagers fully vaccinated. That's very good. Uh, look at the numbers though. We have a little more work to do with the younger kids. That just started more recently. I understand that teenagers have been eligible to be vaccinated since June, but I think we can do better. And this is a message I'd like to get out to all the parents, as well as the pediatricians and other influencers on families' health care decisions. Please get your kids vaccinated. Uh, let's give them that extra suit of armor. When the time comes, they can be boosted. We're waiting to hear from the CDC if they're going to have this available for younger kids. But, but I believe this is one of the reasons why we are in a very good place today. It is the people who've been vaccinated, staying out of the hospital, freeing up capacity, as well as just our numbers overall have been declining. So this is something we're gonna continue. Remind, despite what happens, we are gonna continue focusing on vaccinations and our boosters. Over 6.6 .6 million New Yorkers have received their booster. Many more are eligible and we're gonna to continue to get them uh, availability, availability of boosters out there to everybody. So as I mentioned, we're going to look back a few months, look where we are. Overall cases are down, positivity rates down, hospitalizations are down, cases per 100,000 are down, and new admissions are down. That is a beautiful picture. That may be one of my favorite slides. Uh, and vaccines and boosters are up in our hospital capacity. So New Yorkers, this is what we've been waiting for. Tremendous progress after two long years. And we're not done, but this is trending in a very, very good direction. And that is why we are now approaching a new phase in this pandemic. And well, how do we know we're in a new phase? I've been talking to everybody, uh, people in the local dieters, getting their reflection, talking to businesses, everybody from, as I mentioned, Dr. Fauci and healthcare experts, we rely on Dr. Bassett regularly. She consults with other national leaders in our neighboring states. Talk to elected officials, talk to labor leaders. I talked to called every major healthcare leader uh, in the hospital, hospital CEOs. 
business leaders, talked to many businesses over the last few days, as well as educators, school superintendents, parents, uh, the leaders of the teachers unions, everybody I could think of has received a phone call from me to ask them how they feel about where we are, where we're going, and what we should be doing next. So consulting with all of them has given me uh, not just the data, but the on the ground view from the people that are most affected. And that's how I make uh, the best decisions. So uh, we had a mask or vax requirement for businesses. It was an emergency temporary measure put in place literally two months ago. And at this time, we say that is the right decision to lift this mandate for indoor businesses and let counties, cities, and businesses to make their own decisions on what they want to do with respect to mask or the vaccination requirement. Given the declining cases, given declining hospitalizations, that is why we feel comfortable to lift this in effect tomorrow. And I want to thank all the businesses and the county leaders and the health departments and places as far away as Erie County uh, who did the right thing to help us get through this. I believe this has made a huge difference and it gives also patrons of businesses the comfort to know that they are safe when they went into these stores during our most vulnerable time when we saw those numbers literally off the charts. And now those numbers are coming down and it is time to adapt. However, we want to make sure that every business knows this is your prerogative. And individuals who want to continue wearing masks, continue wearing masks. And I suspect when I walk the streets of New York City, as I often do, I'm still going to see a lot of people wearing masks because they will feel safer. That is something that they are very, very welcome and encouraged to do. But in terms of having a requirement, uh, it is being lifted as of tomorrow. And so thank you to the business owners. Uh, it wasn't easy. You're always, I've walked in a lot of restaurants showing here in New York City my vaccination card. And I just want to thank all of them you know, for everything they did. They are part of the New York story and our response to this pandemic. They are an example of what leadership even in their own lives and in their own communities looks like. And they stepped up. And some of them, it wasn't pleasant. But I want to thank them because, because of them, we were able to lift this at this time. Again, I will always always retain the flexibility to make adjustments if necessary. You know how I operate. I'm looking at data, looking at trends, looking at everything that's out there. But I also uh, want to deal in the reality that we have a very good picture that has been painted over the last few weeks, and particularly uh, as we are approaching the expiration date of this temporary measure that's been in place now literally for two months. So let's talk about some places where it's still in effect. We are still going to continue for now the requirement at state regulated health care facilities. I think that's very obvious of why we want to make sure our health care facilities are safe. Uh, that would be adult care facilities, nursing homes, correctional facilities, schools and child care centers, and I'll be talking about that in a minute, homeless shelters, domestic violence shelters, as well as bus and train stations. Um, the federal government regulates the airports, the airplanes, and trains like Amtrak, so that is still under their jurisdiction. Uh, but also just know that those are more concentrated areas as well as the areas where we believe people are most vulnerable. I want people to know this pandemic is not over. It is not over. And that is why we're still going to maintain protections for vulnerable populations in areas where people are very concentrated because I want people to feel safe. I want people to still feel safe when they come into the cities and go to their jobs that they're not going to contract this virus. And you're going to hear a little bit about this from Dr. Bassett in a couple minutes, but a day doesn't go by where someone doesn't tell me they're also experiencing long COVID, long haul COVID. And this is devastating for people who want to get back to work, but just have so many symptoms they cannot. So, so I want to just strike the right balance here and let people know that the time in our judgment based on all these metrics is correct to lift it for the requirement for businesses, but also there are vulnerabilities that we can need to continue to protect uh, until further progress is made. So that's important to know. Now, ask me the most common question I get asked in the state of New York. I think you know. Uh, when are school masks coming off? Let's talk a little bit about history here. Literally on August 17th, one week before I was sworn in as your governor, I knew I needed to hear from the education field. I spoke to PTAs, school superintendents, 
principals, uh, all the leaders, uh, the leaders of the representatives of the teachers, parents, everybody. I said at the time, and this was August, there was still talk that there were schools in our state and school districts that were going to continue remote. I said, no, no. We have to get our children back in schools. We went through that experiment. It served a limited purpose to keep some educational engagement going during the worst, worst months of this pandemic. But now we had started having vaccines available starting that summer for older kids. The numbers were looking better. And I said that these kids, based on all the experts I've been talking to, need to be back in a safe learning environment because the mental health effects and the isolation and the depression and all the other collateral damage that our students went through, we need to start healing and help the teachers who went through hell and back to do the very best they could while their own kids are being uh, learning at home on, on the kitchen table and they're trying to teach a classroom. And the parents, everybody went through a lot. And I said, what is the best way we can get our kids back in school and keep them open, even though other parts of the country, they were thrown in the towel and saying, well, we'll just leave them all remote. We couldn't do that here in the state of New York. We value our kids, we value education. And I said, we have to make sure our schools are open. So after consulting with all these people, part of that whole education e ecosystem, we decided that the safest way for the students, the teachers, the administrators, everyone who's part of that system, the safest way for them to return to school was to have a mask requirement. That's what we talked about before I was governor. We instituted my first day in office and said that the era of remote learning is over, except in extraordinary circumstances. And that was the whole genesis behind the mask mandate. So keeping kids safe, keeping them in school. That's still a priority. You know, it was just over the December holidays, right afterward, you saw in places like Chicago, everybody's saying it has to be remote, we have to stay remote. No, we were smart. We got test kits out to everybody. We, have, we gave an opportunity for people to find out who may be positive before they came back from break. We've been using really smart practices here to say, no, in New York State, our schools are open. So that's gonna continue to be a priority. So what we wanna do, we know there's another break coming up. Most of the public school students in the state uh, will be back the week after uh, February 28th after they've had their winter break. Some of them may be traveling to other states, maybe going to Disney World. I'm not sure where they're going, but uh, they won't be in class for at least a week, 10 day period. So let's talk about when the kids come back, or even before that, let's make sure that there's test kits and we're giving them out right now. And I'm gonna talk about the extraordinary number of test kits we've amassed in a very short time, more than any state in the nation. And what are we doing with them? Getting them out to schools, getting them to parents, getting them in the hands of people that can find out whether a child is positive before they come back. And that's how we stop the spread. So after this break, parents will have test kits for their children. We want them to test the day after they come back. And again, three days later, and let the school know if your child tests positive, keep them home. But by that Friday, just a few days after the children come back, we'll be able to look at those numbers, but not just those numbers. We're gonna be looking at everything we've looked at throughout this entire process that actually led us to today. We're gonna to look at the cases per 100,000. We're gonna look at the percent positivity. We'll also keep an eye on hospital admissions and even pediatric admissions. What's happening with them? Are they continuing to decline, which is a very good metric right now? Look at our vaccinations. It's just one of many factors to look at, as well as we are gonna be watching the global trends. We were forewarned about Omicron the last time. Throughout the fall, if you remember, even New York City's numbers were about 1% the entire fall. And all of a sudden, Thanksgiving came a week later and it all broke loose. I'm not saying that's gonna happen. I pray it does not happen, but I do know that it'd be negligent on our part not to be watching closely what is happening elsewhere as we calculate the best way to keep our children in school and safe. Therefore, after the break, after we had kids tested, uh, we are going to make an assessment that first week in March, based on all the metrics I've just described to you, and look at that combined picture 
There will not be one number that says yes or no. It is going to be an assessment of all these factors that have guided us throughout, guided us to the decision we made today, and that will give me the comfort as well as the conversations I had yesterday uh, just on a Zoom call talking again to school superintendents, principals, PTA leaders, called out the teachers, uh, administrators, everybody who's part of that system. We solicited their input, their advice, and I believe that they felt comfortable with this approach, that it's not reactive, it is thoughtful, it is based on everything we've been doing since day one, and we've done it successfully. So I wanted everybody to have that picture, as well as we're developing right now, anticipating that day will come, that we're developing the guidance in consultation with all the people I just mentioned, all those organizations. And it's not going to be ready yet because we're going to fine tune it every single day, but there should be very clear guidance. So schools will know what to do in a circumstance. You know, if the masks come off, someone tests positive in the classroom, what are some of the triggers? And so that is what we are going to take this time now to amass to make sure we get it right. No other state has done that. The federal government has not given guidance, so we have to be very thoughtful because we know that as New York goes, others will be following our lead and how we manage the situation in this new phase. So I want to be very clear. Uh, we're going to talk about a new winter toolkit. But this fight is not over. We're not surrendering. This is not disarmament. We're going to continue to be adaptable and responsive to the changing circumstances. But again, the trends are very, very, very positive. So we are going to have this blueprint for moving us forward, and I'm just going to give you some of the outlines, mm. reinforcing everything we're doing, protecting the most vulnerable, increasing our vaccine and booster doses, strengthening the health care system, empowering local leaders, and supporting New Yorkers who are dealing with long-term effects of COVID. And I'll go through each one of those briefly. Uh, the most vulnerable, we know where the most vulnerable are. They're in our nursing homes. They're people who are immunocompromised. There are uh, people in hospitals, congregate settings. And yes, for now, they are in our schools. So we are going to continue focusing on protecting all of them. And this means testing. Uh, look at our nursing home cases, how they spiked. Uh, December 10th, we only had 678 active nursing home cases. Uh, given the size of the population, that was very positive. By January 14th, we had 8,500 nursing home cases. Thank God they're coming down. They're still down considerably, but uh, they are still a concern to us. You know, these people, even if they're vaccinated, uh, it is still a concern because many of them, again, have underlying health conditions, and we want to make sure that we do everything we can to protect these individuals. So, so we're going to continue watching this. And so that's why we're going to maintain our visitation rules uh, I talked to Washington about this. I asked them to give us more flexibility because they have regulatory power over institutions that accept Medicaid. So we are going to continue to ask people who visit individuals in nursing homes to have proof of a negative test within 24 hours of their visit. Continue wearing your masks in there. And when you're visiting families, again, this is a strong statement that, yes, you can still visit people, but we're going to ask you to do it safely so you don't spread the virus inside a setting that is very, very vulnerable. So we're not saying suspending visitation. We did not do that before, but we want to make sure that people do it in a smart way. And so we've been providing high quality masks, uh, the N95. We've been providing testing kits. We are out there uh, requiring vaccination availability, requiring that they make boosters available way back in November before all of this even hits. So focus of ours, nursing homes. Uh, the vaccine, I mentioned before, we can do better. We're going to keep uh, increase in the amount of opportunities. If any school would like us to set up a vaccine pop-up, we have them all over. We've been doing hundreds of them, and we're also uh, going to continue our testing. Testing sites are going to remain open. Vaccination sites are going to remain open. We encourage people to take advantage of them, especially if you're going to be traveling or seeing uh, someone who might be in a, in a vulnerable situation. So uh, we're going to get more young people vaccinated, hopefully. I need everybody on board with that. Also, we're waiting to hear about Vaccines being available for the younger kids, uh, you know, little ones up until age four. Right now, it's not been approved, but we're hoping the Pfizer vaccine will be available for them even at the end of the month, and then we'll be encouraging people to take advantage of that. So that's what we're going to continue doing. And we have to just prepare for whatever comes our way. No one could have foreseen how 
this pandemic and even just Omicron in the last couple months really brought our health care system to its knees in some parts of our state, exposing vulnerabilities that have been there a long time. And it really hit people hard. And those health care workers, again, I can never give them enough gratitude for what they continue to do. I try to go out and visit as many as I can and say thank you. But uh, that rings hollow uh, sometimes when they're just feeling like they're in the throes of this. So we're going to keep protecting our health care system. We, as I mentioned, have amassed more test kits than any state in the nation. 92 million, 92 million test kits have been acquired, have been ready to be deployed. We've distributed over 27 million already. Schools have received 14 million, and that's gonna to continue to go up as we make a real concentrated effort as this holiday is coming up. And we're distributing masks, as I mentioned, to our counties and to nursing homes as well. So, so making sure everyone has a high quality mask is one, one of our strategies to deal with these vulnerable populations. Also, you know, the shortage of workers, it, this has been incredible. I've really focused on this, uh, particularly in our budget address. And last fall, I signed an executive order to increase staffing flexibility. That's going to remain in place. We've deployed the National Guard. They're still on site. I've visited them and also training our National Guard. When I said, hey, let's call the National Guard. We need them in our nursing homes and our hospitals to backfill and add support and find out that very few had medical training, we are now changing that dynamic so our National Guard members are being trained so the next time around they can be administering vaccines and being more engaged even, uh, but although their presence has been so so appreciated. So I mentioned uh, what we have to do in the budget. We have to strengthen this health care system. We don't know what the future brings. All I know is that the present needs to be dramatically improved. And I don't know that if we have another experience at all like this, that we can count on the federal government to deliver the resources that they have done in the past. So I'm viewing this as an investment now to add resiliency and sustain our health care system, which we saw the vulnerability in many communities. And so we are making the largest health care investment in state history, $10 billion. It also includes, includes $4 billion in bonuses and improvements and upgrades for our facilities that really need help. So you'll be hearing more about that. That's capital improvements. That's to help our hospitals. A lot of hospitals lost income. When you think about the length of time that they were not able to conduct elective surgeries, that's a revenue source for them that was cut off during the pandemic. And those, those once it was restored, even again, those that fell below 10% capacity this past fall and as we were dealing with Omicron had to cut that off as well. So we know that's been a drain. So we need to work to help build them back. Also working with our local leaders, um, you know, just a few names here, uh, our county executives, our legislators, they've been incredible. When we've asked them to help us set up vac sites or get test kits out to people, uh, I've consulted with them, we're fully engaged, speak to the associated counties and mayors and local governments. I come out of that world. I know that it's important to have the voices of those communities represented, and I want to continue empowering them, and so we're going to continue working with them as well. Another issue, as I mentioned a couple times now, is this long COVID. And I am very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Bassett being willing to champion this issue and lead our research into this and gather people, as she'll talk about. Uh, we know there's a lot of people, like I mentioned, a day doesn't go by where someone doesn't tell me they or a family member are experiencing the symptoms. We want the healthcare industry to treat this seriously. We've taken steps to make sure that people receive adequate medical treatment as well as uh, reimbursement for lost wages. And again, I'm proud of what we're going to do. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bassett to talk about a gathering that we had asked her con to convene, and she did very successfully. And we're going to continue working on that as well. Dr. Bassett. Thank you. Should I speak from here or from the podium? Wherever you like. Here's fine? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, for that introduction and for your focus on long COVID. Uh, as the governor has outlined, as we see the acute infections from COVID decline, we also have to reckon with its long-term effects. And one of the most troubling of these is what clinicians have called post-acute sequelae of COVID-19, commonly known as long COVID. People with long COVID do not uh, have symptoms that do not improve symptoms that recur 
or change in the weeks or even months after infection. And this syndrome has been documented not only in people who had serious COVID illness, but also in those who had mild illness and even those who had apparently asymptomatic infection. It's a problem that likely involves millions of people around the world. Our understanding of long COVID is still evolving, including its occurrence, its patterns, its risk factors, and its mechanisms. So it remains poorly understood, but there's no question that it is real and that it can greatly disrupt the lives of those who are affected. And that's why the governor and our department has been so keen that our state be at the forefront of responding to long COVID and identifying ways to support its diagnosis, management, and therapies as they emerge and are shown to be effective. Last Thursday, the health department hosted a convening of experts on the issue of long COVID uh, with the purpose of speaking with both clinical researchers, basic scientists, physician scientists, legal experts, patient advocates, and others about the many aspects of this condition. As far as we know, we're the first health department in the nation to have this sort of, of gathering. And it was aimed not only at the clinical care community, but the general public and including people living with long COVID. So it was a very impressive group. And the event was live streamed. I can give you all the website if you missed it. It's ny.gov stroke long COVID panel. So the goal of these discussions was to learn as much as we can and to share this knowledge. And we had three separate panels, one focused on research, one on models of care, and one on policies and practical steps. We're very grateful that it offered a rich discussion. We're writing up a final kind of report and synopsis of the recommendations that came out of it. But I, I'd like to share a few of these recommendations today. The first, of course, is that we need more knowledge. And in, among the things that will aid this process is establishing formal case definitions so that clinicians know how to diagnose long COVID. You may be aware that the, the health department has a history of developing these. It was the state health department's clinical definition of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children that formed the basis for what became the Centers for Disease Control case definition. We need more provider education so that providers understand that this is a condition that they should seek and diagnose. Many individuals report being bounced from provider to provider to provider who has been unwilling, uh, maybe even not interested in listening to their symptoms. So we need to increase diagnostic ability and competency. And uh, finally, this health department has the privilege of overseeing Medicaid, uh, one of the most important insurers in the state. Uh, this offers us the opportunity to pioneer mechanisms for reimbursement of care for people living with COVID, long COVID. And we will be looking into how we can leverage this approach. We also have learned from other conditions, HIV being a prime example, how important it is to involve the affected community in this work. So all of this will also include adopting an equity lens. We know that Black, Hispanic, and Indigenous New Yorkers have borne a brunt of COVID acute infections, and we need to be alert to the occurrence of long COVID in these groups. We also need to ensure that access to the best possible care is not limited to people who have resources, but is available to all for this newly recognized and emerging condition. It should never be a condition for which only people with resources get care. So this is a few of the things that we're looking into, Governor, and I, I thank you and look forward to sharing more information in the future. Thank you, Dr. Bassett, for the very thoughtful approach that you have brought to this conversation. And you really are an, a national leader on this, in this conversation. I suspect you'll be asked to address uh, many organizations and gatherings of healthcare professionals as we delve deeper into the causes as the place that was the hardest hit uh, the first time. And now it's Omicron. And you can start. We have a pattern of individuals who've been experiencing this from the very beginning. We want to make sure that they, they know that we are taking it seriously 
just acknowledging that it exists and taking people's complaints seriously is an important step uh, toward uh, eradicating this. So again, recapping our winter toolkit goals, protecting the most vulnerable, increasing our vaccine and booster doses, strengthening the healthcare system, empowering local leaders, and supporting those who are experiencing long COVID. And with that, uh, we'll be taking questions. Again, I'm very grateful to New Yorkers for helping us get here, especially the businesses that hung in there through some very challenging times. And uh, we wish you the very best success. So thank you. Governor, Governor. Governor Murphy has set March 7th as a date to remove masks in schools. Governor Lamont has set February 28th. And you have said we'll reassess. So tell New Yorkers, why are the three governors in the tri-state area not on the same page? We're very close. I think you'll look at, we're talking about the same time frame. I just laid out the way I've been doing this from the very beginning is to look at all the variables that I've outlined and those data, that data is available to me every single morning. I consume it every single day. And I just want to assure New Yorkers that I will be making that decision. We will be making that decision based on the most recent data available to us. And that is assessing the situation after the children come back from being with their families, perhaps traveling, perhaps having older siblings from college back in the house with them. So, so we just want to know, let New Yorkers know, this is very much top of mind for us. We understand the interest in this. We also want to let people know that we're going to continue on the data-driven, metric-driven approach that has been so successful for us this, this, this thus far. And just as a quick follow-up, if the data on that Friday, March 4th, shows there's barely been an uptick or things are basically where they are now. Could you envision them lifting the school's mask mandate the following Monday, March 7th? That is a very strong possibility. Um, but I am not, I will factor all the data that's gathered during that week, look at everything else I've mentioned, as well as global trends, global trends. And I also want to make sure that our guidance is very thoughtful on what could possibly re-trigger the institution of this again, hopefully never again, but we have to be realistic. This has not been declared over. This pandemic is still with us and we are gonna continue reassuring the people of this state that we'll take the most thoughtful approach possible based on data, metrics, experts. And so we're talking around the same time frame. It's just that we're approaching it the way we have been uh, with every issue related to the pandemic. Governor, Governor, why not wait until after Super Bowl Sunday when people are gathering in homes or bars or restaurants? And also, uh, does the vacating the mask mandate apply to people taking the subway and buses, mass transit? No, I, I said that mass transit is still covered by this. Areas where people are congregating and where there's almost impossible to do any tr contact tracing where you have random encounters in a crowded subway, for example, or on a bus, we're gonna keep these in place for now. Again, willing to reassess. Let's take a look at it again in a few weeks and see where we are. Let's continue talking to our leaders in Washington and the CDC, what their analysis is of the overall prognosis for this. That's what I'll feel most comfortable with. And as I mentioned before, the, the trains like Amtrak that go interstate as well as airports are regulated by the federal government. So those mask requirements will still be in place. With respect to the Super Bowl, kind of a tough topic for some of us who didn't make it this year, but um, I know some will be watching. I, I encourage the businesses to do whatever they choose to do. They may feel more comfortable. The place I watch Buffalo Bills games in lower Manhattan, I guarantee you are going to be sitting there wearing masks. I mean, they're going to feel that level of comfort. They're going to want to still wear their mask. It will not be a requirement, but I suspect we're going to see many, many people still wearing their mask. This is about empowering them as well as their local governments. The city of New York can make its decision, the counties, the boroughs, as well as individual businesses. So that's the point we're at now. We are not saying it's over. We're not saying that we are recommending or not recommending this now. We've just we, we instituted this emergency temporary measure exactly two months ago, promised New Yorkers we'd evaluate it at this time, and now the numbers have improved dramatically based on the presentation I just gave. Yes, what is the questions. difference between a high school setting where there's a reasonably high level of vaccination and the business office setting? A lot of parents, especially those older students, are wondering why the delay for them especially? Because those children, students, sit together all day long in close proximity to each other. 
they go to lunch together, they involve, they're involved in gym class together. They are, whereas in a workplace, people have the ability for movement. Uh, kids are in a very concentrated setting, and also adults can make their own decisions. Children still need adults to look out for their health. This is all about looking out for the health of our children. And parents will be reassured to know that we protected them. We made sure they got back to school in the fall. If we had not taken the steps we did, we could have been like other states where it took weeks and months to get the children weaned off of the remote learning and in the classroom. This bold step at that time sent a message. Our priority is getting children back in a safe learning environment, unlike remote learning. So it's accomplished that goal. And so businesses will make their decisions. We are still setting forth to protect the students, but the numbers are trending much better and there definitely is an end in sight. Well, that follow up, could there be a difference between the under fives and the over fives? Because in the timeline we're talking about, they may just have about a week of vaccination eligibility based about what we know on approval. Could there be a difference? And, and if you care, uh, Dr. Bass, to comment on what prep the state is doing to distribute to the under fives as well. Well, it hasn't been approved for under five yet, so we'll certainly follow. You know, this will be mostly in pediatricians. I don't see someone with a two, you know, one month old baby driving up to a mass vaccination site. They're gonna ask their pediatrician, I'm a mom. Uh, I'm trusting my pediatrician with that question. So, but we'll make sure they have plenty of doses. When, you know, we've told Pfizer, Pfizer knows they're a New York State business. Every time they're doing anything, I'm saying, okay, I know you have to take care of your federal government obligations, but as soon as this is commercialized, goes to market, uh, we want to be right out there to to address. So we'll be very aggressive in making sure that we have the supplies available to them. So was that the second well, part of your question? That was the second part. Yeah. Would you consider a difference in the masking requirements for under five and over five because of the difference in the vaccination time allowed? Well, you're talking about if there's kids in preschool. We're talking yeah. about school age. Would, so, so you're talking about four year, three year. Okay. Uh, I would say that we are, will process all this as we work on our guidance. Would you agree with that, Dr. Bassett? That I would. Good? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Well, we're, this is the this is what this month gives us, is the opportunity to really be thoughtful about all these nuances that you're raising, and I thank you for raising them because this will give us time to lay out a game plan. So, you know, if this change occurs, that parents will know, when we know, you know, all the factors have been considered. What happens if someone still tests positive? What if it's 20 kids in a class? What happens in school? We're already processing all the different variables of what could happen and we're going to be thoughtful about it and anticipate as many as we can and get the right answers uh, through guidance and that's what that's what this extra month gives us as well. Governor Hochul, um, two questions. Uh, Jumani Williams just received the endorsement of the WFP but as we've seen in past years uh, they have endorsed the incumbent governor when their candidate has lost in the primary. Would you be willing to accept their party line if uh, you uh, defeat Jumani Williams in the primary and they offer it to you? And second question is uh, Eric Adams is testifying for lawmakers right now uh, for the state budget. Uh, have you, uh, how many times have you spoken to the mayor about uh, his asks for the state budget so far since he's taken office? We've talked many times as recently as yesterday and probably the day before that. Uh, we are in regular communication, but having served in the state legislature himself as a senator, he is well aware of the process that the budget goes through, the governor presents. Now the conversations go with the legislators and then we sit down and work it out and end up with a product that is uh, the very best it can be for, for New Yorkers. So uh, that is what we're anticipating. And I'm not going to engage in political conversations right now uh, at this time. I, it's a long way off. I'm focused on keeping New Yorkers safe. On the mask mandate, just to be clear, this doesn't affect any vaccination mandates that are in effect, right? Like here in the city, um, vaccination is required to enter restaurants or sporting events or other indoor venues. That remains, right? And also separately, can you talk about what effect this has on the pending lawsuit that initially struck down the mandate in uh, Long right. Island? Right, and this is part of the conversation I had with Mayor Adams uh, when I was reaching out to leaders all across the state. Uh, he said he will wait to see what New York State does and, and make a decision. This is where I, this is accomplished exactly what I wanted. I wanted to empower local cities. If they want to be more restrictive, counties want to be more restrictive, boroughs want to be more restrictive, businesses want to be more restrictive, they, as of tomorrow, are at liberty to do so. So they know that. Um, second part of your question, I got to write the, the lawsuit. Oh, the lawsuit. Um, we are continuing to proceed in court because we are 
will continue to maintain and demonstrate in a court of law that New York State and its health department has the power to protect the citizens of the state. That is questioned in the lawsuit, and I believe will be victorious to establish that very basic premise that has guided this state through a global pandemic, and we want to ensure that we still have the ability to make the right decisions to do exactly what we've done uh, for the last two years. Okay, I'll put to Zoom. Uh, Governor. Uh, Thank you very much, everyone. We're going to jump over to Zoom right now. And then our first question, Governor, this afternoon comes from Makai Becker of the Buffalo News. Makai, your mic is open. Hi, yes, it's Maki Becker. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, a number of other governors who have decided to um, lift their statewide um, school mask mandates um, left it up to the local, you know, and you were just talking about empowering local governments to do so. Can you talk about why you decided not to do that? Well, they're still talking about a month down the road. And what they will do would be lifting the statewide requirements they, that they put in place. And my understanding is that they will decide if they're going to leave it up to the localities, local governments. Um, what I would say from my conversations with the leaders yesterday, they want to make sure that they have, um, they, they prefer that it be a state on or off requirement. Uh, it is challenging for an individual school board or a school superintendent. They would say that they are not the health care experts. So we'll leave it to individual health departments, county health departments, on what they choose to do. But there was a desire uh, when this was first talked about even to have the state take the step themselves. So it really takes them out of the decision making and forcing them to analyze all the metrics and the hospitalizations and the infection rates and all the other factors that we have access to. So, so that's why that made sense. Thank you very much, Governor. Your next question this afternoon comes from Bernadette Hogan of the New York Post. Bernadette, your mic is open. Hi, Governor, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Bernadette. Great, thank you. So Mayor Eric Adams is testifying right now in front of lawmakers in Albany and his big asks have been focused on criminal changes to the criminal justice system. He said he wants edits to the state's bail laws, raise the age, um, discovery, and wondering, will you make those changes, support those changes? And also, what are you doing to talk to Speaker Carl Hasty and Majority Leader Andre Stewart Cousins to negotiate those asks by Eric Adams? You said that you would permit him to take the lead on this, you would support him and what his asks are, but what would you, what are you going to do to negotiate this with the legislature? Well, I think we've established one principle of my public comments. Uh, I will not be negotiating in front of a press conference. It's not how we get a successful result, which is a budget that meets the needs of New Yorkers. I spoke with Speaker Heasty yesterday. I spoke with Leader Cous Stuart Cousins the day before. We are in regular communication. I have been having uh, conversations with many, many of uh, my colleagues in the legislature, assembly and senate. So those conversations continue as well as, yes, we are interested to know what mayors all across the state have as part of their agendas. And it is all processed into a larger conversation on doing what's right for the state of New York. And all of this will be resolved and known uh, as the process unfolds. But right now it is information gathering. The legislature is having hearings with the express purpose of getting people's viewpoints, listening to them, processing them. Uh, I laid out a very uh, well thought out budget with over 220 policy proposals. I'll be talking to them about those, the funding sources, also making sure that we have money set aside for a rainy day or a blizzard day, as I've described them, should this ever happen again, and we need to be prepared. So there's uh, been very, Bernadette, there's been very uh, frequent and uh, impactful conversations even this early in the budget process. So I, I feel uh, good about what will be the ultimate outcome. Thanks very much, Governor. Your final question this afternoon, we're going back to the room. Marla Diamond. Marla, go right ahead. <laughs> Didn't want to cut you off there, Marla. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really wanted to hear from Dr. Bassett about this uh, mask mandate in schools because we've heard uh, one doctor says one thing, one says another, uh, whether children are, uh, you know, uh, less vulnerable to, to COVID, they get sick less, we've heard from doctors and others have said, 
you know, it's not time to lift the mask mandate. So a lot of parents are wondering what the doctor's advice is. Oh, sure. Yes, okay, I was just uh, well. Obviously, the governor and I talk, and uh, and the the uh, facts that she's reviewed with you today. Uh, I've also been part of the discussion and reviewing them, and I agree with the framing that she has used. You are right. Uh, it is true that children have lower rates of uh, COVID hospitalizations than uh, older people. Uh, but we did see these go up during the Omicron uh, pandemic disproportionately, especially among unvaccinated children. These rates are all coming down. All of the rates that we've, all of the numbers that we've been looking at are going in the right direction. So I absolutely think that the strategy that we've identified is the prudent one. We'll look at the numbers, we'll see where we are, and then we'll make a decision. Uh, I, 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 there is a, a lot of uh, discussion. This has become a polarized conversation, even within the medical community. I, I think it's always best when we try and stick with facts. Uh, unfortunately, even the facts can become uh, contested, but I'm confident that we're looking at a whole range of facts and we're looking at the right ones. And just as a follow-up, given the, the low um, numbers of uh, Five to 11 year olds vaccinated, aren't you concerned that, you know, without this extra layer of protection in, in the schools, you do indeed lift the mask mandate that you've got a lot of kids that aren't vaccinated walking around? Well, as you know, there's never a, a press conference or any setting in which we talk about COVID that we don't talk about the importance of vaccinating kids. Uh, so if your question is, do we want to see more children vaccinated? The answer to that is, of course, yes. The risk to schools is related to the levels of community transmission, and that's what's plummeted. Uh, so we're looking at all of this. Yes, if your child is not vaccinated, we would urge you to vaccinate your child. Uh, something like a million and a half children have received at, one, at least one jab, uh, half a million of them uh, in the younger age group of 5 to 11-year-olds. Uh, so parents should feel confident that this is a, a safe vaccine. And uh, uh, so it, it, it's not a question of stopping vaccinations. It remains uh, absolutely critical to our response. Governor, just on a very basic level for your average New Yorker who's vaccinated, um, do you want them still wearing a mask when they go into a store? And does that vary at all between New York State, New York City and the North Country or other places right now? As I mentioned, I think we'll see varying degrees of uh, individual compliance, not compliance, but um, uh, mask wearing. I, I suspect you'll still see many more in the city. I've seen people walk the streets outdoors wearing them for months, even though they've not been required. I think it's people's personal comfort level. Uh, going into a crowded store, uh, especially if you're in a, in a risk category or an area that's still, I mean, there are still parts of our state that have uh, higher transmission rates, you know, statewide it's very good, but we have pockets. I think people ought to just use their judgment on what they feel safe with. And I also want to make sure that as people make that decision, that they want to continue wearing a mask or a business wants to continue having their employees wear it or at a restaurant or patrons, that we respect that. I don't want to have a situation where people if it ends up being among kids, someone's bullied, or that in a work setting that someone is uh, criticized. We have to respect each individual's right to t assess their own risk. You don't know if someone doesn't have a child with asthma at home or an elderly parent living with them and they want to continue uh, taking every step they can to protect themselves. We just want to look at an overall state policy that's based on where we are today, but this is empowering for the New Yorkers you're speaking to. New Yorkers are smart. They're very smart. They've been following this. They've been staying with us, by and large, from the very beginning. And that is why we have one of the highest infection rates, oh, I'm sorry, one of the highest vaccination rates in the nation and one of the lowest infection rates. Vaccinations up, infections down, because of New Yorkers being as smart as they are. So I think they'll all be doing the right thing. Thank you very much, everybody.